Hello and welcome to episode number 517 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell. Thank you for inviting me into your eardrums. My guest today is Sutanya Dakers. Sutanya is a podcaster whose new memoir, Dinner for One, How Cooking in Paris Saved Me, just came out. Her memoir is the story behind her podcast. She met and married a French man, moved to Paris, and then their marriage didn't work out. But it's also the story of her staying in Paris, rebuilding her life, and learning to embrace her new home, cooking dinner for one, one evening at a time. We are going to talk about being a Black American in Paris. We're going to talk about roasted red pepper salad and whether or not there are chicken fingers in French supermarkets. Please note, this was recorded while she was obviously in Paris during a thunderstorm. So there's a wee bit of that weird Zoom metallic sound, and I apologize about that. Thank you to Justine Shaw and Laura Giannino for helping me set up this interview. Thank you also, as always, to our Patreon community. Hello, folks. Thank you so much for supporting the show and helping me make sure that every episode is accessible. And thank you to Garlic Knitter for the fabulous transcripts. If you would like to have a look, you can support the show at patreon.com slash smartpitches. This episode is brought to you by my favorite comfortable shoes, Rothy's. I love Rothy's shoes. And I was so excited when they asked to partner with my show. I have bought my own pairs for several years now. I got my sister-in-law into them. My mother-in-law loves them. And I should warn you that if you do buy Rothy's and you start wearing them everywhere because they are so comfortable, you will get compliments. I personally love traveling with them. And for an upcoming trip, I'm trying to decide which ones to bring. I love the red points that I have. They're probably my favorites. I also love the blue points. I really love the lace-ups and the pink driving moccasins are my newest pair and I kind of dig them a lot. It's a really tough choice because they are so perfect for looking dressed up and staying very comfortable. They work great with every outfit and there's a style for every situation. And because they are woven, they stretch. They are so fantastic. It's really hard for me to figure which ones to bring with me. Best of all, when they get dirty, I chuck them in the washing machine and they come out looking like new. Did I spill half a pot of turkey broth on my one blue pair? Yes. And are they perfectly fine after a wash? Yep. I love these shoes a lot. Not only because of how they look, but how long they last and how many colors there are. Your new favorite shoes are waiting. Discover the versatile styles you can wear absolutely anywhere and get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash Sarah. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash Sarah for $20. $20 off your first order. This episode is brought to you in part by Pear Eyewear. I love my pear eyeglasses and I'm so excited to have two pair of glasses to choose from. Usually I only have one per year and the pair come with customizable options. As I've mentioned before, I have worn glasses my entire life and I really didn't like that I had to do so until recently, but now my glasses are a familiar part of me. I don't look like myself without them and I love having more variety in how my glasses look thanks to Pear Eyewear. Pear Eyewear's base frames come in a classic set of styles. I have the Finley in blue tortoise, but the corners are magnetic, so I can get custom top frames to change the color, pattern, style of my glasses anytime. My sunglass frame is gold glitter with rose gold lenses, and I love them so much. Even one of my teenagers thinks they're cool. Base frames start at $60, including prescription lenses, and there are hundreds of top frames to choose from. Get started by choosing your base frame with options from the square to the cat eye. Then pick top frames and build a collection that fits your style, however it changes. Get glasses as unique as you are. One pair, infinite style, starting at just $60. Go to PearEyewear.com slash Sarah for 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at P-A-I-R-Eyewear.com slash Sarah. This episode is brought to you in part by Athletic Greens. If you are looking for an all-in-one supplement to start your day and you'd like one that tastes good, who wouldn't? Take a look at Athletic Greens. I started taking Athletic Greens because it is so easy. It contains everything I need and want in a supplement. It is fast and it tastes good. First thing in the morning, one scoop, cold water, done. It's so easy and my stomach never gets upset. It's lifestyle friendly, it's vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, contains less than a gram of sugar and has no GMOs. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and is a climate neutral certified company. It's great for travel too. Their convenient travel packs are easy to bring along, especially if I'm changing time zones and I don't know when I'll be hungry or what will be available. Athletic Greens is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every day to take great care of yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. 
To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Sarah. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Sarah to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. This episode is brought to you in part by Thrive Cosmetics. I have been replacing all my makeup because it is expired and I have more events on my calendar now than I have in a long time. Thrive Cosmetics has helped me rebuild a makeup collection that is fantastic quality and really fun to use. I love the Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara. You've heard me mention this, but always replace your mascara first. If you don't know how old it is, it's time to replace it. This mascara is fabulous. No clumps, no flakes on my eyeglasses, and it washes off so easily with warm water. It's their best-selling product with over 15,000 five-star reviews, and it doesn't irritate my eyes at all. My lashes looked incredible. Plus, for every product purchased, Thrive Cosmetics donates to help women thrive. Their Bigger Than Beauty program has donated products and funds to over 200 nonprofit giving partners across the country, including Refuge for Women and Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence. Now is a great time to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com slash SPTB. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash SPTB for 15% off your first order. This is an episode that might make you hungry, so you might want to grab a snack, but let's do this interview on with the podcast. So hi, people that are listening. My name is Tanya Dakers. Um, and I am the creator and host of the podcast, Jennifer One, and the author of the recently released memoir, Jennifer One, How Cooking in Paris Saved Me. And I still live in Paris. I'm another American living in Paris. <laughs> Congratulations on Dinner for One, <laughs> Thank you. on the podcast, Thank you. Thank you. and the memoir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> is, it, is it really sort of unreal to be like, wow, it's really out in the world? Yeah, it's the, I've been I've been dealing with a lot of conflicting feelings, you know, from like excitement to nerves to anxiety. Like my stomach, uh, there's been a huge knot in my stomach since like Saturday. And so it's still there. I've been like weepy, like my face has been like leaking. <laughs> so yeah, just like a range of emotions. But you know, the the I guess the the biggest or the the, the emotion that I'm leaning into the most is that of like happiness and joy. It's very personal to talk about. Yeah uprooting your life, moving abroad, and then getting a divorce and chronicling that. Um, it's a very deep, deeply personal exercise. Can you tell me how the memoir and the podcast came to be? So the podcast came to be because I was just running amok in Paris, doing non porte as the French say, just like falling back on kind of self-destructive behaviors that I found comfort. And when I was in living in Connecticut, where I went to university, I talk about on the memoir, um, just like going out a lot, drinking a lot, you know, trying to use uh, dating and ch- getting into relationships, no matter how short lived with other men as the way to help me not focus on my new reality. So I did that for a while until I was like, yeah, no, this is not cool. We need to get ourselves together. And then so I started making these like small little dinners for myself. And I found them to be quite helpful, just in helping me be present in the moment and gave me a moment to reflect as well and slowly get used to my new reality, which is to be alone in this in the city and to be single. So as I was doing that, I was still kind of at a point where I wanted some guidance or I wanted to talk to other people that were had experience or were experiencing the same thing as me. But a lot of my friends at the time were, you know, just I was quite young when I got when my ex and I broke up, I was like 30, 31. A lot of my friends were just starting to like get married or engaged or like buy apartments or move in with their partners. And I don't want to be the friend that's like, love sucks. <laughs> you know? So I felt like I couldn't really vent to them or I could, but to a certain extent. Yeah. So I started looking online for blogs or any kind of resources for or written by American women that moved to Paris for love and it didn't work out. I didn't, I didn't find it. And a lot of what I did find were like, you know, American women that came to Paris, lived this fantasy, and they're still living the fantasy. Um, and also a lot of these women were white American women. You know, they didn't look like me. They didn't have the same experience as me. And so I just thought someone should be talking about this, adding a different perspective to the American in Paris narrative. I was like, you know what? Why not me? And so, yeah, I just, and I didn't want to do a blog because I'm really not good at photography. 
Um, and I don't have the discipline. That's the real truth. The truth is I don't have the discipline to keep up with a blog. Um, and I thought it would be interesting. At the time I was, I was listening to a lot of podcasts, notably like Call Your Girlfriends, which is a um, podcast hosted by me and so and Anne Friedman. And I really loved this idea of like having these people that I admired in my ears and feeling like they were just talking to me. And I, I wondered what that would be like if I shared my story in a podcast format. Since it's so personal, I wanted people to feel like they were in my kitchen with me. And also um, what it would be like for people to experience food in a different way, not with the senses that they're used to, which is smell, sight, and taste, but just with their ears, right? And they hear me cooking and all that stuff. So that's how the podcast started. And um, the book, you know, my agent heard me on another podcast. I was just like, I was talking about dating in France, which is in Paris, which is just like, ugh. <laughs> and so I had a lot of opinions about that. I had a lot of opinions. And my agent heard me. And uh, my, the woman that would become my agent heard me on that podcast, got in touch with me. One thing went to another. And uh, yeah. So basically the memoir is filling in the backstory of, of the start of the podcast. Because the memoir starts with you meeting your ex having yeah. this wonderful relationship over email and text. Yeah. And then things don't work out. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I rebuild myself. Through, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I really appreciated was the number of times you pointed out the very curated, very white mm. expat versus immigrant language and the way that the the curated look at what it looks like to be an American in Paris is a very specific narrative. And that when you don't fit that narrative at all, it's really alienating and lonely. Exactly. And you just, you know, you, you it also makes you wonder, like, at least in my case, it was kind of like, I'm an American in Paris. I was supposed to be living this perfect curated story. Why didn't it happen to me? Right. There was a lot of you know, feelings not only of failure because my marriage ended, but also from this, like, I'm not living the life I should be living here, you know, in this city. I'm not living up to people's expectations of what an American in Paris experience should be. So I studied abroad in Spain twice as a teenager, once when I was 15 and then once in college, which is another time of really establishing your identity when you're a teenager. And there was supposed to be an English speaker in my host family, but there was not because unemployment was like 20% at the time and he got a job as a point guard for a professional basketball team. So understandably, oh, cool. he was yeah. not home. He was of playing course. basketball. Like, yeah. He was like, adios. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta go. Have fun. <laughs> so the parts where you wrote about being sort of tossed into the deep end of a different culture with limited language skills and no one to really guide you through once you and your husband split up really resonated with me. I remember very clearly thinking, I only exist in the present tense. I can't mm -hmm. conjugate my verbs. I can't do past. <laughs> Future's kind of easy in Spanish, but in the, I'm mostly in the present tense. I exist only in this mm -hmm. moment. And I, and I loved how as you decided to engage with learning more French in context, you did that with shopping for food, which is a very, and yeah. also I love going grocery shopping in other countries. It's like my <laughs> favorite thing. When did you start to feel like you really existed in the past and in the present in, in Paris? And I'm curious, was it when you learned to think in metric? Because that is one skill that eludes me. I, it's been nine years. I still don't think in metric. <laughs> I'm so relieved no, to hear that. No. Yeah, yeah, no, not me. I don't think I'll ever. All um, I no, know no. is that 32 Fahrenheit and 32 Celsius are both bad. That's yeah, all I know. exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I still like, you know, we recently had a heat wave and I was telling my parents, I can't believe it's going to be 100 degrees. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's going to be 100 degrees on Saturday, guys. You're like, we don't understand your weird American way of like, you know, describing <laughs> the weather. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I still think, I do not think in metric. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm, think, I'm kind of relieved. <laughs> I think I felt kind of Frenchifying myself, but I felt more comfortable with the language and I, I felt like it was becoming a part of me when I was actually able to kind of like argue with my crotchety neighbor. Oh, which is using present, past, and future tense in this yeah. day, you know, in the conversation. So I think it was when I, when I was able to stand up for myself yeah. and not shrink myself and not, and not go back into this kind of like, oh, I'm just a little American in Paris. I don't know, kind of um, safe space. When I was able to advocate for myself, um, yeah. that's when, yeah, 
that's just, been my my identity as like a sort of Frenchified American in Paris, you know, started to feel true and, and feel like me. And I was no longer pretending and I was no longer scared. Does Cranky Neighbor still live there? Oh, Cranky Neighbor still lives there, but you would not believe what happened. Tell me everything. So on Friday, last Friday, so I started, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I started a supper club for single women in Paris. Yes, I saw that on your Instagram. It's luscious. So thank you. So I've been doing that. And Friday, I had like a big kind of like blowout um, apéro extravaganza at my place yeah, for season cool. one. And like all the the ladies that participated came with so much fun. We got, you know, we had all the drinks and we all went out. But my neighbor didn't come upstairs, which was nice. And he's been pretty nice to me recently. And the other day, um, I he overheard me in the stairwell talking about my book and everything. And so he, he stopped me the next time we saw each other. Sorry, that's my neighbor in his motorcycle. He stopped me and was like, oh, so you're writing a book? You wrote a book? And I said, yes. And I told him about it. And he said, oh, that's lovely. You know, felicitations. Fast forward to this Friday, the supper club at Peru. Saturday morning, it's like, at my door, I'm like, oh my God, it's him. I open the door and he's there in his like little white shorts <laughs> and he, and like a little white t-shirt and he has a bottle of champagne for me. <gasps> Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not making this up. Luckily, my so I have a couple of um, friends from college that are in town for the book launch events and stuff like that. And one of them is staying with me this weekend. So she was actually here, like with a half a croissant in her mouth, witnessing <laughs> this interaction. <laughs> and yeah, he, he was like, you know, I wanted to just, you know, congratulate you on your book. That's so wonderful. But then, of course, he like scolded me because of all the noise he made. So it was like a compliment with a complaint, typical French. But yeah, so the cranky neighbor is still cranky, but like we're like friendly now. Well, I mean, there's been an exchange of bubbly. Next, you'll be on each yeah. other's holiday card list. Right? Yeah. Right? <gasps> yeah. I feel like that's a really big moment when you relocate your life, when you win over the crankiest person in your orbit, right? Yeah, literally. Yeah. Congratulations. I'm actually thinking I might invite him to my place for like a little apical. I haven't opened the bottle yet. So when I open it, and like his story is pretty sad. Like, we, were, you know, once he started talking, he told me that like, you know, his sister died and they lived. Um, so she apparently she lived downstairs as well, but in the apartment just in front of his. And neither of them had any kids. And like his parents are dead. He doesn't have any other family. So it kind of made, he's like a lonely old man. And it made me feel like a bit sorry for him. So I think I'm going to invite him up for like to share the champagne with me because that was really nice of him to That's do That's really that. lovely. And he's the one who maintains all the flowers in your courtyard, right? Yeah, that's him. That's him. Yeah. I feel like such a creeper. Like, he's the guy that's in your house with the flowers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote about him. Everyone's going to know about him. I should tell him that he's a little, he's going to, he might be known in the U.S. Big yeah, in America. You're going to be famous, sir. Get ready. When you show up, Get ready. When, if you cross <laughs> the pond, man, people are going to be like, oh, it's you. It's you. You're the neighbor. <laughs> I also appreciated the moments in your book where you talked about how being American in Paris supersedes being Black in Paris when people interacted with you. And I did not know that the French don't track race in their census. So they can be post-racial, except not really (laughs) at all. And they, they have colorism and they have racism and they have colonies for crying out loud in the Caribbean. Still. Still today, yeah. in the year of our Lord, 2022, yes. Yeah. <laughs> How has your experience in Paris translated to your friends and family in the U.S.? I mean, I talk about it with them, but it's not something that is unexpected from, from Black people, right? It's, no. I don't think I would... I don't think I would tell them anything that I think the only thing that sh- maybe was, would come as a surprise is like France is sold as it's like racial utopia. So when I just pretty much said like, that's not the case and I'm gonna tell you why it was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so it's just like a, unfortunately, you know, black people after a certain age, you're almost conditioned to expect racism and to and expect to be discriminated against. Um, and you kind of have to just like, not be surprised or try try really hard not to be surprised by it and expect it so that when you do experience it, it doesn't, it, 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 it isn't as damaging. The thing about racism and discrimination that really sucks is how harmful it is to your confidence, to your sense of self, yeah. to how you see yourself in this world. I can't speak for Black people as a whole, but for me at least, I think just expecting it 
helps to make it hurt less because it's like, well, obviously, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is a really, it's a really hurtful way to walk around the world, to walk in this world. But I know that as a black woman in, you know, this country that we're living in today and the world we're living in today, I need to protect myself in every way that I can. And to just expect sometimes some stupid people to be racist towards me and discriminatory towards me. I think when I talk to my friends and family back home, the ones that are black or people of color, they're not too surprised. No. You know, the issues that the U.S. has with black people and blackness, or American culture has with black people and blackness, or the complicated relationship. It's not France's complicated relationship with blackness, right? Like my American issues have nothing to do with France. It's a different country, different culture. So French people just see me as, you know, yeah, looks like an American, just someone from a different country that they admire, that they find interesting, that, you know, they find American culture very fascinating. My country, my culture, my citizenship definitely trumps my blackness. I say this all the time. If I was a black woman from Senegal named Fatima or like Cote d'Ivoire or something, and I had the same level of education, same personality, same, you know, kind of creative pursuits, I think that my, I'm pretty confident that my experience in Paris would be very, very different. I just wouldn't be as free. And also there's something great about being, you know, you studied abroad, so there's something great about being a foreigner, right? You can be present and be there. Then you can also escape into your little world and also use your foreignness as an excuse. It's like to get, you know, remove yourself from like cultural gaps or just to people be more patient with you. People don't have as many expectations. Oh yes. As well. I think French people have a, when they think of Black Americans, they think of Josephine Baker, they think of jazz musicians, they think of the parts of American, of Black American culture that have just become part of American culture in general, like our most celeb- celebrated icons. They think of them. So like also our Blackness is viewed in a positive light. Yeah. You know, we're not putting their colonial history you know, what they've done in Africa and other parts of the world. We're not putting it in their face as Black American. When it comes to being someone who's French, but also you have a different kind of background. So like if you're like French Algerian or French Senegalese or, you know, even French American, like in order to survive in France, you have to become French. Like there isn't much room for that other part of you. You know, or the other part of you, she like, it's just like an asterisk. And yeah, I think about that. I want to stay here. I would love to have kids. If I'm lucky enough to have kids, not on wood, in this country, my kids are going to be French. And they're going to be so, so, so French. They're going to be French with an American mother. Yeah. Which I just, I never thought about that. And and I think it's because growing up in New York as the, you know, Jamaican and the child of Jamaican immigrants, I always teach myself Jamaican American and they were both cultures that I lived with and both of them are a part of who I am. And I could be both of them and no one would question that. Whereas here, it's just like, you got to be French and that's it. Yep. There isn't much room for others. The fact that I am American, like if I have kids like, okay, it's cool. Your mom is American. That means you like speak English fluently. Like that's great. And but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Like they're just going to be French. Yep. One of the things that really resonated with me about your memoir is the idea of how the French embrace the idea of pleasure and that mm-hmm. there is no guilt. So mm-hmm. in my in my actual like predominant part of my job, the, the mm-hmm. podcast that I run is connected to a website called Smart Bitches Trashy Books, which is all about romance. And romance is always called a guilty pleasure. It is something that we struggle with in the, you know, the lexicon mm-hmm. of the romance genres. Oh, it's a guilty pleasure. And in France, there is no guilt when you experience yeah. pleasure. Pleasure is to be yeah. embraced. What are some of the examples of embracing pleasure that you love? And I do have to say your memoir has made such an impression on me because when I went and had lunch today, I thought, okay, you're not going to look at your phone. You're not going to do anything. You're just going to enjoy what you have on your plate. You're going to think about how it tastes and you're going to slow down. And I was like, wow, that was really fun. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Super fun. Yeah. It's just like little things like that. Um, I, the pleasure of doing nothing. Yes. Like French people will go to a cafe and sit there all day and maybe have a coffee and then maybe they'll have a bite to eat and they still sit there. No one's going to bother you, ask you to leave. And they just like do nothing. And no one, and if you say, you know, if I say to a friend, like, I, I didn't do anything today, I just at a cafe, they'd be like, you know what, good for you. You got to take time for yourself. Good for you. Yeah. You need to just relax and not do anything. So for me, that's been the biggest pleasure as a New Yorker is to just not feel guilty about taking time for myself and just like doing absolutely nothing and and, and not having it considered, you know, wasted time or being inefficient yes. or just living and experiencing life is enough of, 
you know, occupying my time enough. Yeah, I can get joy out of that, you know, and take pleasure. And that's really a lovely uh, idea. I I have always been fascinated by the fact that in um, in France, in schools, lunch is like an hour and a half. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That worked, too. Yeah. And when my children were in elementary school, their lunch was 20 minutes. What? No, no, no. Sit. Not only do they have an hour and a half, they have like real cutlery. Yeah. And they have to sit and they have like three courses and it's a whole thing. And yeah. And the, their lunch menus are are shared with the parents ahead of time and they eat like really well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they eat like birth board and you're like, what? It's not sloppy Joe. <laughs> I never had sloppy Joe. <laughs> yeah. There's no chicken fingers. There's no chicken fingers. I don't, you know what, honestly? I, shit, I, I don't think I've ever seen chicken fingers in a French supermarket. I'm literally going to go check out the Monoprix um, either when we finish this or tomorrow to double check, but I'm pretty sure I've never seen a chicken finger. I've seen like breaded, like chicken breasts or things like yeah, that. Yeah, cutlets, right? I mean, or schnitzel. Yeah, cutlets, but I've never, yeah, but I've never seen chicken fingers. One of the things I love about the memoir is also that the whole back of it is recipes. And I know this recipe came from your former mother-in-law, so I hope you don't mind yeah. if I ask you about it, but can you tell me more about this Algerian roasted red pepper salad? It sounds so good. And it is. And as someone that doesn't like peppers, like for the, so my ex-husband, his background on his mom's side, his mom is Algerian Jewish and his dad is Italian, mostly Italian, but like his dad grew up in France, whatever, but his entire family before it's Italian. So, you know, food is a part of his life, right? Very much. Grew, yes. Extreme right? food. So, yeah, yes. And lots of it. Like there's no, I'm hungry. No. I mean, there's no, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> just like piled on you. And so for the longest time, so his mom actually introduced me to North African um, food and also like, you know, Sephardic Jewish food, which I had no experience with. All this time, I thought I was eating couscous in New York, but no, 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 we we're not eating couscous. Like the way she cooked with all the meats and the vegetables and the sauce is incredible. Anyway, sorry, I digress. The That's fine. pepper salad is very good. And I actually didn't like, I I wasn't a big fan of peppers, actually. Like the first couple of times, you know, she kind of presented it and was kind of like, you know, this part of the meal. I didn't really eat it and you know, super rude. But she's like, I'm sorry, I don't like peppers. And then I don't know what happened. One day, like my, uh, we were at my mother, my former mother-in-law's uh, apartment. We'd go there at least twice a week. She lives in Paris and I'm really close to her. And even to this day. Oh, that's um, lovely. She's an amazing woman. I have so much respect for her and I admire her so much. And my love for her is deep and true. And yeah, she's fantastic. We'd go there a lot and always food. And the salad was there. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this goddamn salad. <laughs> my mouth was just like, oh, why have I, I been missing out on this? It's so good. It has this, so it still tastes like peppers, but then there's this like kind of like sweetness to it. And they're really soft. And it's just like, and you know, I would like, because France baguette, like with the French bread, like dipping it. Oh, chef's kiss. <laughs> so. And from the recipe, it seems like it's really easy to prepare. It's super easy. It gets better the longer you like just like let it sit, right? So she would like start in the morning. If a bunch of people are going to be there for lunch, she's starting in the morning. And by lunchtime, it's good. But like if you had the other batch with dinner, oh, so, so good. And so simple. Yeah. I cannot wait to try that. Hope you like it. I hope I like it too. Because I, I was like you, I don't like peppers. And then I realized, wait a minute, I like them when they are roasted. Yeah, when they're roasted. Yeah, really good. I also love that your podcast and your memoir also circle back to roast chicken. Is roast chicken the foundation of all things? Uh, pretty much because that's the first thing that I made was a roasted chicken. It's just something that is it's seemingly complicated, but it's not. Yeah. You know, kind of like what I did, which was stay you know, kind of rebuild my life after my divorce. Yes, when you're you're confronted with the end of what was supposed to be your forever relationship and the love of your life, and also in a new city, it seems complicated to start over. But, you know, with like a few simple ingredients, like self-confidence, self-love, bestowing kindness upon yourself, and just a will and a determination to power through, you can do it, you know? And all I needed for the chicken is some olive, good olive oil, and butter, Salt, pepper, paprika, et voila. Yeah. Why do you think people are so fascinated with Paris? I think because it's, I don't know. I mean, it's just really beautiful. It is. It is beautiful. 
Yeah. It's just really gorgeous. And the French have done a really good job of like branding themselves with Parisians at least. And I think there was this fascination with Parisians or French people in general because they are so confident. Yeah. Because they are so nationalistic and because they really like don't give a fuck about what anyone thinks about them. They deeply don't give a fuck. They don't deeply, deeply could care less. If no, if no foreigners were to come to this country, they'd be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just that like self-assuredness. They're just kind of like, we're like this. If you don't like it, well, not my chair, not my problem. The whole kind of like pleasure aspect. I mean, lug- the luxury and the, lug- the luxury industry is just so big here. Yep. I think because they know how to live, like French and Italians, they know how to live. Oh, yes. So what books are you reading that you would like to tell people about? I always like to share book recommendations. Well, I have my little stack here. Thank you. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's one that I don't have because I actually, a friend just borrowed it and I'm like passing around my girl group. It is called Rethinking Sex by Christine Emba. And it is essentially questioning how much harm the sexual liberation has done to how we view as a people, especially as women, view sex. And how we liberated the idea of, you know, sex as a free-for-all. It's taking away from the fact that sex is actually a really vulnerable act to share with someone. Yes. And the fact that we're treating each other so badly with the advent of apps and all that stuff, that it's really doing more harm than good. And she did, you know, her perspective is mostly from a cis heterosexual um, perspective. But I think it's someone that I would hope that it's someone no matter, you know, their sexual orientation or their gender, that they can and should put more care and thought into sharing themselves with someone in such an intimate way. And it's, it's, it's made me really think about what I want in a sexual relationship with someone and how I as well, you know, it's not just, you know, one way, like the man and me, but even me, like how I treat men that I choose to engage in a sexual relationship with and my expectations and their expectations. It's just really made me think. There are a lot of things that people might not agree with, which is fine. Um, and critique, which is fine. But I think her overall message of, um, the fact that sex is a big deal, mm-hmm. you know, and we should treat it as such. And we're actually doing more harm to ourselves and good when we just, when we don't give it as much care and attention as, mm-hmm. as, as we should. And so I really, I really enjoyed that. And I'm passing around my, my, my girl group. And I'm also reading The the Lonely City by Olivia Lang. I know this came out a couple uh, years ago and she's a British writer. And this book is pretty, oh, sorry, it's The Lonely City, Adventures in the Art of Being Alone. Ooh. So it's kind of like profile plus slight memoir. So she moved to New York City. I forget exactly when this was, but she moved to New York City to be with a man. And when she gets there, he dumps her. <gasps> and so she's already she's already like subletted her apartment in London. So she can't go back. So she's just in New York City. And so she writes about what it's like navigating New York City 100% alone while profiling different artists that like a part of their art was being alone, being loners. Kind of so she profiles like Andy Warhol, where she talks about him and like how loneliness played a role in his art. I loved it. Um, and then I also read 24 Hours in Paris, which, you know, this full disclosure, this is a friend of mine. Um, and she used to live in Paris. And it's just like you're it's a rom it's like a rom com. Two people that like, work together in New York City and they come to Paris on a work trip and then they're the only two that they, you know, their flights get canceled, so they have to spend 24 hours in Paris together and they kind of fall in love. And you know, typical. Love but it. it's so well written good, and I really enjoyed it. And this, I've been still thinking about it. Lessons in chemistry, this is fiction by Bonnie Garmus. And it is about uh, so the protagonist is this woman named Elizabeth Sock. And she's, you know, this is set in the ninth, late 1950s, early 1960s. And she's a chemist working at a lab called Hasten Institute. And she's a very intelligent, strong, confident woman and sure of herself. And a woman like that working in a lab in, 19, in late 1950s, you can imagine she was not very welcome. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a few things happen in her life that lead her to be a single mom. And as a way to kind of put food on the table, she becomes a host of a TV show, a cooking show. But what she does is instead of doing a kind of typical, this is, you know, this is how you roast a chicken, whatever, she turns it into chemistry lessons. So she explains to these audiences, like housewives, essentially, how the fact that cooking is actually chemistry and it's science. And in doing so, she empowers them to believe in themselves and to go for their dreams. Wow. Um, yeah. And it is just an absolutely brilliant book and I'm obsessed with it. And I hope I explained it right. I'm correctly. I'm sorry. They're really good. I still think about Elizabeth Zott and the character. And I want to know what she's doing now and how she's living. And I think it's actually going to be adapted. I think if I, 
if I remember correctly, because I listened to a podcast episode that featured Barney Garmus, and I think it's going to be adapted. But yeah, it's really good. That's awesome. So yeah, those are, those are the books that I recently finished. And I'm going to start a few and I head off to vacation next week. Oh, where do you get to go? I'm going to Italia. Oh, no, more food. What are you going to do? Hey, prego, prego. <laughs> Gotta I'm going to eat your gestures. Manja, manja. <laughs> Piano banco, per favore. I've been practicing essential vocabulary. Listen, you need to know how to get your food. Yeah. Find yeah. a bathroom. Yeah. Get yeah. Gel- gelato. Very important. Get gelato. Yeah, very important. I have a book recommendation for you. Okay. Because you were talking about um, rethinking sex. There's yeah. a book by Emily Nagoski called Come As You Are, Ooh. which is all about okay. the science of orgasm. Ooh, and what okay. happens to your body and how it works. And it's very, okay. very interesting because it, okay, it, it reframes all of the ways in which you think about female orgasm and female intimacy. Oh, love that. Love that. Well, where can people find you if they wish to locate you on the internet when you're not in Italy drinking wine and eating gelato? <laughs> um, you can find me at dinner for periods like the punctuation one, O-N-E. On Instagram, that's where I spend most of my internet time. And that's the only place. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not anywhere else. So that's where you can find me. And on the podcast as well. Um, I would recommend if, you know, this is this is your first introduction to me and number one. I would actually recommend reading the book first so that you get an idea of like what kind of brought me here. Mm-hmm. And then, or like what led to the decision of me falling in love. Well, not decision, but how I was able to fall in love with this French man, the whole like you know, online courtship and transatlantic relationship, blah, 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 divorce. And then the podcast, you can listen to my post-divorce glow up. <laughs> How I have uh, <laughs> been here to live, try to live my best life in this glorious city, which I feel so honored and blessed and grateful to live in. I was listening to some episodes and I was listening to the one where all of your friends come over for dinner and they're talking about the podcast and they all recommended the episode, uh, Greens Do a Body Good. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is a good one. But I think the one where you and your friends get together and talk about the language of friendship is probably my favorite episode. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to hear that. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you again to Sitanya for connecting with me. Thank you to Justine Shaw and Laura Giannino for helping me set this interview up. And thank you for listening doing whatever you're doing. I imagine you're cleaning or cooking or maybe you're dyeing wool or doing something really crafty. Thank you for inviting me to keep you company. I'm curious, have you ever uprooted your life and moved to a very, very different place? Was a culture shock a thing for you? I would love to hear what you thought and what your experience was. You can email me at sbjpodcast at gmail.com. You can leave me a voicemail at 201-371-3272. I love hearing from you. So thank you for listening and thank you for being part of the podcast community. As always, I end with a terrible joke. And this joke is from Maggie's Door of Horrible Jokes. I cannot thank you enough, Maggie. These jokes makes me so happy. Are you ready? Who is Frosty's favorite aunt? Give up? Who's Frosty's favorite aunt? Antarctica. You kind of see that one coming, but it's still really fun. Thank you, Maggie. (laughs) On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you back here next week. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts.